good morning everyone uh, welcome to the fifth day of the conference and uh, it happens to be the last day with the uh, scientific sessions because tomorrow we have a trip to historical place and uh, we are uh, privileged uh, that today we have a special lecture by professor ajay sud and uh, this is a platinum jubilee lecture so uh, I'd like to invite our director, Professor Tarun Sauradip, to say a few words. Good morning. Uh, welcome to this special event in our Platinum Jubilee year. As you know, the past year from November 7, 2022, we have been celebrating our, uh, you know, the Institute walking into its 75th year, and we'll be completing that in a month. And uh, today is particularly special because we wanted to mark it with a you know, research talk of highest quality, which we would call the Platinum Jubilee Lecture. And uh, so it is true that uh, it's not really a public talk or a colloquium, but a research talk, like many great research talks have been given in this auditorium. So I should also mention that in this year, we uh, this is the ongoing conference is the fifth of the six international conferences we have organized at uh, the Raman Research Institute and also take this opportunity to welcome all the uh, speakers and participants of the conference. I was uh, not there in the, on the first day. Uh, so we couldn't have thought of a more appropriate uh, person to deliver the Platinum Jubilee Lecture at Raman Research Institute. So Professor Ajay Sood is arguably the most eminent uh, experimental physicist in the country and has huge global recognition. He has worked in the area of uh, hard and soft condensed matter. And over his period, I'm sure he has touched many areas. And he has also provided leadership uh, to the country in many ways. I mean, he has been, of course, at the Indian Institute of Science uh, from 1988 onwards, after a short stint at uh, the Department of Atomic Energy Lab. And then, uh, he has been the president of the Indian uh, Academy of Sciences uh, about a decade back, and uh, more recently, the president of the Indian National Science Academy. He has also been recognized uh, with the, uh, uh, one of the highest civilian awards, the Padma Shri. He has, uh, of course, won the Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Award. Uh, he has the Third World Academy of Science Prize and uh, many, many more. I can spend a lot of time on this. But uh, I think um, this is ideally what Raman Research Institute stands for, that we you know, want to give emphasis to the fact that we are fundamental researchers, researchers who are delving into phenomena of physics. And uh, I think uh, this is the most appropriate way we thought uh, we could uh, celebrate it. So I would be amiss if not to mention that he, at this point, holds the highest uh, scientific position in the country. He is the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. He also chairs the Prime Minister's Science Technology Innovation Advisory Council. And uh, he has been in the council, I understand, uh, even in another period of 2009 to 2014. So he has provided leadership to the country's science uh, for more than a decade and a half, I mean, or as per the CV, but maybe a lot more if you look at the students he has produced and uh, the community he has grown. But uh, he, I am aware that he you know, spearheaded the nanoscience mission uh, at, uh, in the, of the country. And at this point, we are, uh, you know, so we have just launched a national mission for quantum uh, technology applications. And you know, uh, the entire science and technology community is looking forward to his uh, guidance and leadership in taking this forward. Uh, and to success is, of course, a very important area where we want to you know, make a mark as a global uh, science country. He has uh, also, you know, uh, come up with this National Research Foundation, which is a new uh, paradigm in which uh, we want to you know, transform the way scientific funding is done. And I can imagine the huge responsibility it places on him 
to make that a big success uh, so that India can go forward. So again, today uh, he is here as an academic, as a researcher of high eminence uh, to deliver a, a talk appropriate uh, to the conference. And he'll be talking about new paradigms in nano heat engines. Professor Sutta. Thank you very much, Tarun, for this very, very kind introduction. Uh, it is indeed a great honor and pleasure for me to be here to give this Foundation Day lecture uh, at a juncture when uh, RRI has uh, been occupying a seat of prominence in our science uh, community, science ecosystem, uh, for the last uh, so many years since it is founded by our one of the greatest scientists of our country. So uh, special, it's indeed a special honor. When I had agreed to Sayantan and Ranjini's email, I thought I was giving this technical talk. Uh, but then, uh, so gracious of you to uh, also put it as a Platinum Jubilee lecture. So I apologize that it will be a technical talk because I did not uh, plan for uh, this thing. Because these days, this is the uh, price you pay once you move to Delhi because uh, people expect that you have forgotten science, <laughs> you don't do science, and you only talk about science. So I have to keep on reminding myself that there are two sides of my life, and because I still have a group in ISC and still answering referees' question as of yesterday. So, so it's a different uh, way of uh, uh, living, but uh, absolutely a pleasure because I want to keep uh, uh, both sides because I really see there is a huge synergy. Uh, I can really appreciate the issues uh, which uh, science has, in, which needs science policies, it new instruments, and also the other way. So indeed a pleasure. So I will be uh, talking to you today about uh, nano heat engines or the colloidal heat engines in which uh, we have been engaged over the last uh, more than uh, 10 years. Uh, and uh, so I thought this is an opportunity to see what do, uh, where do we stand in terms of uh, understanding this uh, mesoscopic or nano heat engines uh, in terms of stochastic thermodynamics and what are the challenges. So, uh, sorry, I, uh, this is, uh, this sums up, uh, so this colloidal heat engine is made by trapping a colloidal bead in an optical tweezer and the temperature of the reservoir is changed. So here the temperature is changed between 1824 and 1574. You will be surprised how because it is still in water and all of us know from high school water boils at 100 degree uh, centigrade and I will uh, tell you what uh, this stands for. Uh, what is, this is the effective temperature and in this heat engines uh, you will see that the piston and cylinder, they have been replaced by an optical tweezer uh, and the opening and closing of the optical tweezer really mimics the piston going in and out. So let me first uh, say the people who have done all the work. Uh, so this is a, a good part of it is uh, Sudesh PhD thesis uh, uh, submitted uh, not long back and now is a postdoc uh, with uh, Carlos Bustamante in University of Berkeley. And all the work have been done with uh, Rajesh, uh, uh, who is here in the audience, uh, at JNC and his student. Uh, one of them is Nilendu Roy. So it has been extremely fruitful and ongoing collaboration. And without this collaboration, I don't think we could have done uh, so much as we have been able to achieve. So thanks to all the collaborators and also uh, for uh, the slides, which you see very nice slides have been made. I have uh, borrowed shamelessly from uh, uh, them. Some of them I have made. So this is a talk which is uh, uh, for the whole on behalf of the entire group. And I would like to apologize to two people in the hall uh, because this talk is based on a plenary talk I gave recently in Stat Physics 28, maybe three people. Chandan was also there. I've forgotten how many. Uh, uh, but uh, somebody had told me that till now, nobody has died after listening to the same talk twice. 
so i assume that state uh, so so i think that statement will still be true after my talk uh, and uh, but uh, please indulge yourself uh, to know what you could not uh, see in the uh, stat physics talk uh, so let me take you back to your high school uh, the macroscopic heat engines uh, we all know that uh, these heat engines are really the milestones in the foundation of classical thermodynamics and uh, we we know that in this heat engine what we have uh, is the application of first and second law of thermodynamics and we know that the famous carnot engine which is for reversible uh, cycling between the hot temperature hot reservoir and the cold reservoir uh, uh, this is in pv diagram you have the isotherm uh, uh, expansion then you have a adiabatic expansion then you have a uh, isothermal compression and then adiabatic compression uh, for this the uh, the absolute limit of efficiency which is w uh, work done by the heat input is 1 minus t cold and over t hot this is the story since uh, uh, almost like uh, 200 years or even uh, almost 200 years we'll be celebrating uh, next year this another version which is what we will be using in today's talk is the stirling engine where this part is replaced by isochoric cooling so you have a isothermal expansion of the gas maintained at a uh, temperature th by connecting it to the reservoir uh, hot reservoir then you have Uh, isochoric cooling to the cold uh, uh, temperature t cold then isothermal compression uh, of uh, the gas and then 4 to 1 is isochoric uh, uh, heating i was wondering whether i have written heating isochoric heating so this is the cycle which you perform in stirling cycle and since there is a irreversibility here you will have slightly less than the carnot efficiency so you have the working gas which is in between the piston and cylinder tends to power 23 molecules per cc and uh, this has been the story uh, in our whole civilization the way civilization grew with the advent of heat engine it's all for us to see and the question which we are asking today is what if the working fluid is a single particle or a single atom is that possible at all so you can reduce uh, the size if that is what you want to do or something more so uh, so what i want to first immediately say that when we talk of uh, miniaturization because, uh, to reduce it to one particle or few particles it is not just a miniature miniaturization of the macro scale engine that is not going to work when you talk of a single atom or a single particle what we are dealing with that when you uh, have only one particle you really cannot talk of an average temperature average pressure average uh, entropy and so on you have to talk in terms of averages so here the fluctuations in the thermodynamic quantities is the key thing so what we are talking is in a fluctuation dominated regime how do we talk of heat and work done in uh, in a, a very uh, 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 self consistent manner so this is not just a miniaturization uh, mechanically that you reduce it so as i told you this is one version which is what has been the working horse or the working particle in the last few years and uh, uh, this uh, uh, idea was given way back in 2008 this is a very very famous paper Uh, in applied physics letter uh, uh, schmidl and seifert they looked at thermodynamic carnot cycle with a single particle in a trap this was a theoretical construct and they showed that you can extract work done if you define the heat and the work appropriately in the dom uh, in the uh, uh, fluctuating uh, fluctuation dominated regime so what you need to look at is the particle trajectory when uh, you have uh, i'll explain to you what is given here but knowing the particle trajectory in this potential well which is usually a harmonic potential well you can really calculate everything so uh, so what is done i will not spend time on it i'll say more clearly 
uh, in a minute. So this was uh, demonstrated very, very beautifully by uh, uh, Bettinger Group in Stuttgart, which, where it was implemented. So what they did, they uh, trapped a colloidal particle, and the temperature of the bath, which is, surround, which is uh, having the colloidal particle, was varied by another laser pulse. So the temperature could be varied from uh, 90 degrees centigrade to uh, room temperature cycling. And, uh, they, and then for the isothermal expansion, this is the well you open up. And this is very, very easy to do in a controlled manner by laser light intensity. So you vary the laser light intensity, so you know how the spring constant K, which I'll be calling in my talk, varies along 3 to 4, very, very precisely. That you can determine independently. So uh, you, uh, you uh, do this uh, expansion uh, when the potential well uh, becomes uh, much broader at a high temperature, when the bath is, let's say, at 90 degrees centigrade. Now at this stage, you cool the bath uh, to room temperature, and this is the isochoric uh, 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 cooling. And now from 1 to 2, again, you play with the laser light in a controlled fashion, and you compress it, and then you again have the isochoric heating. So you can do very precisely. So what you know experimentally, you know the particle distribution in each state point, but also all along. So there is nothing which is you are missing because you are imaging the particle all along when you are varying the k. It's a very, very controlled experiment, and there is no uh, unknown element. Once you know all this, then uh, you can uh, uh, get the work done and the heat. I will just tell you in a minute. Let me show you the first, the, uh, again, the slide so that it uh, stays with you. This is the slide I will not show in the next 50 minutes. All of this will be used repeatedly for various uh, manifestations of the heat engine. So what you know, how the potential energy varies with time. Uh, you integrate, that is the work done, we all know. And uh, you can, uh, uh, this is a uh, harmonic potential, so you know easily how to calculate the work done. In heat, there are two elements. One is along the, uh, along the two paths, so isothermal heat and isochoric heat. Again, it's very, very easy to show uh, this. So what you know is the particle trajectories. Uh, and you know how the k varies as a function of time. That's the experimental input. Then you can calculate unambiguously w and q. If you have slightly more complicated issues, like uh, uh, more complication in terms of two engines coupled and also you have to derive that. Because this is something for a single colloidal particle trapped in a harmonic potential. But the methodology is known. Once you do that, they showed uh, way back in 2012, that uh, you can uh, uh, calculate the average power or average work done, which is uh, the red graph. Uh, here, just to say, our convention uh, in the literature is W is negative when the work is performed by the engine on the reservoir and the vice versa. When it is a refrigerator, you do the other way. So that's why you see that you get the maximum work done when the cycle time this is the variable, is very large. This is what I will come back to it because the next story is built, uh, is built up on that. So you get the maximum thing. At a shorter time, you can see that W is positive. Actually, the engine is stalling, and you are not getting the work out. Actually, it is the other way. You are working on the engine. And if you plot uh, power, which is what is plotted here, the uh, average W by cycle time, you can see that it will be zero here because tau is very large. So you get zero power output. Here also you will get zero power output because it is stalling. So obviously there will be a maximum. So this maximum, maximum power, at that time if you look at the efficiency, which is W over Q, you can see that the efficiency is maximum at the quasi-static limit and the place where power is maximum, the efficiency is less than the asymptotic efficiency, and which is again uh, known uh, mathematically what it is. And it exactly agrees for macroscopic engine and microscopic engines exactly. 
So there is no surprise. So this is a, I mean, when people started, it was a surprise that whatever you know for the classical heat engines is exactly obeyed even for one particle heat engine. Please keep this in mind. And more recently, uh, uh, Brownian Carnot engine has been demonstrated because you know that for uh, you need the adiabatic component also in, a, in addition to the isothermal expansion. And this uh, again, OK, I don't have it here probably. Ha, it's here. Uh, for adiabatic control, you can uh, show that uh, from the entropy that T square over kappa or K should be constant to get adiabaticity. And this is easily done experimentally. So they demonstrated a Carnot uh, heat, Brownian Carnot heat engine in the paper uh, very recently, about three years, uh, maybe two years back. Oh, OK, it's not that recent, 2016. Somehow I am stuck in time. I still think it's recent, but it's almost the time our paper came out on bacterial heat engine. OK, this they have used a very, very nice, clever trick of varying the temperature. So the purpose of this slide is to show that you can do this effective temperature not by physically heating or cooling, because that will be impossible to achieve, uh, uh, get this condition. But they do it by electrophoretic noise. So what you do, uh, you have an optical trap around which you put two, uh, capaci uh, two plates in which you apply a voltage, which is a white noise, random white noise. And you can easily show from Langevin equation, depending on the strength of this noise, uh, depending on the V voltage, you can get an effective temperature, which is, of course, the bath temperature, plus the strength of this white noise over this uh, damping constant gamma. So now you can play with this, uh, you know, the voltage you apply, this Gaussian white noise, and you can get any temperature. And this is what has been done in our recent experiment, which is what I was flashing, 1800 to 1500 variation in the first uh, slide. I'll come back to it later. So, so this I already showed, so I will not spend more time on it. I'll come to the first problem, which is uh, the problem we were uh, seized with uh, in almost last four years. So what is known so far in the last 225 years that this uh, whole thing is a finite time thermodynamics, which you already can appreciate, because you will get reversibility only at a very long time when you have taken care of all the relaxation times and so on. But if your cycle time is finite, then you will have irreversibility built in, because there is an issue of demand and supply. So when you have that, and this is what I showed in terms of uh, experimental data, the work done, of course it is negative for work done, gets maximum when you have very large cycle time, means reversible processes, reversible situation. And then it decreases. Same thing for efficiency. And I also showed you that this is something what is uh, plaguing the whole field. At that time, when you have this finite time thermodynamics, the power is actually zero, which is what you uh, need finite power to run your system. But uh, 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 though the efficiency is maximum, power is zero. And in between, there is a maximum power. And at that time, the efficiency, as I told you, is given by curzon Elbaum uh, uh, formula, which is 1 minus Tc over Th. Instead of Tc over Th, it's square root. And this is what was shown. Actually, these references are not given very well in the literature. Uh, 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 Jack, you can see the journal name. Not many people will know what this, uh, how to access this journal. So it was given in 1957 that Novikov uh, gave in Journal of Nuclear Energy in the construct of nuclear reactors. And then again, Curzon Elbaum, this is a readable article, American Journal of Physics, uh, more recently. So this is something has been the case in the last 225 years, that you will have to compromise efficiency to get the maximum power. Please keep it, and that is called trade-off, power efficiency trade-off. Now this has- yes, can I ask Question. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so is this derivable from the stochastic yes, thermo yes, from yes. the stochastic thermodynamics? Yeah, there have been attempts. Yes, answer is yes. And 
<coughs> this is really uh, what people are trying to derive for various, uh, not this trade off people are trying to theorize when the system and uh, energy bath system interactions are Markovian. For Markovian processes, they have shown uh, uh, more recently that there is a trade off. You cannot get away. So that is the situation as we stand today. When we started doing this problem, because this colloidal heat engines, I will show you, they are so beautiful because they allow you a lot of freedom which you cannot have in a macroscopic heat engine. And this is something the uh, first part of my talk. Whether it is macro heat engine or micro heat engine, as I showed you, it is obeyed for colloidal heat engines also. And it beautifully fits to Curzon Albaum uh, formula. And there are various, there is a recent one by Seifert who shows it should not be exactly Curzon Albaum, another uh, small variation, not small, it's a lot of variation, but numerically both are same. So numerically there is agreement. Okay. So please remember you have build up of irreversibility at small time and obviously you will have to pay a price. Your work done will become uh, positive which means it will not be an engine and uh, power will also not be there. So with this we wanted to ask can we overcome it? So this uh, you have to now go back and ask what is really deciding this quasi static limit? You will all immediately say, which is not uh, something uh, 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 non-obvious, as long as the cycle time is much, much larger than the time scale over which things are happening, the heat transfer is happening between your engine and the reservoir, you will be in the quasi-static limit because all the things would have been taken care and engine would have performed well. So this is the limit I was telling which is the uh, what we call the quasi static limit. Now can you tailor <coughs> tau r so that you can go to different less cycle time and still get a heat engine that is the question. And uh, so how to tailor the system relaxation time and can we also do not the entire control do not be greedy do your control on isothermal expansion and isochoric cooling separately. Maybe you can do in one, not in other. That is also okay because then also you will be uh, 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 helping to break down this. So what in macro engines, if you look at uh, what is around us in our life, the tau r isochoric, this part, cooling of uh, the gas in the engine from uh, high temperature to low temperature is usually what governs it. That is what decides your you know, engine uh, speed, which we say in our cars and all, what is the speed at which it works. In, ther in thermal uh, mesoscopic engines, both are equal. Uh, that is the case. How do we now come around this? So this has been, I said, that a burning question uh, for last almost five, uh, ten, seven, eight years. So very, very novel suggestions have been made which are absolutely impractical for an experimentalist. So we were looking for an experimental way to uh, implement. First is infinite pa fast process uh, in irreversible in uh, 2017. Then there is a proposal working substance near a critical point, infinite precision, obviously good for theorists, I am sure uh, we, we are handicapped. Diverging currents and the last one is what our, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we really uh, were uh, hopeful. This is for atomic systems for, for which you can write the Hamiltonian, you can do uh, manipulations on the quantum system. But the key word was, which is what attracted us, that you can get around this trade-off if you can in, uh, manipulate system bath interaction. Usually the system bath are independent. They just are not really uh, deciding the engine Hamiltonian because of the bath. It is not the case in uh, all the life so far. 
But in this atomic systems, theoretically they postulated it. And it's a very difficult paper for us to read, which we tried many times, uh, Sudesh, Rajesh, and myself. But we realized that we don't have to be theorists to understand the paper. But can we get the main point and see whether we can have a classical analog of that? So that was the starting point for our thought process. And I'll tell you how we did it. Now here, you will realize there is a very interesting thing. If you have a thermal noise, which is what the stochastic heat engine is, tau r is reduced to the minimum. And that, because it is the heat transfer using thermal fluctuation, you can write down the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And this real, uh, time scale is nothing but gamma over k. Gamma is the damping constant, and k is the uh, engine Hamiltonian, which means the stiffness, right? This is what limits it in so far. Now, if that is the case, please look at this. The T effective, which we can again define, is the uh, mean square displacement of the particle in the potential well over KB, right? It's a just a uh, equipartition, a, a trivial. Now, if you see for large K, tau R is extremely small. If that is very small, then for the cycle time which you will have, T effective will be independent of K because you have already got very, very small tau r. So there is no hope. This is the regime which people have worked so far. You work with stiffness where this is really not coming in the picture. T effective is constant, which is a big help experimentally. Why? You switch, you turn on your uh, uh, noise, get whatever T effective you want, and your k does not change, right? engine Hamiltonian does not change. But what happens if we work here? Can we bring additional noise to influence relaxation? And this is what we did. So we said we will work in this regime. So we have to evaluate what is k threshold. I'll tell you in a minute. And then work for k less than k threshold. And this was the approach we took experimentally. So this is what allows us if we have a electrophoretic noise. Because electrophoretic noise, I already told you, you can really control the noise extremely well. So this is the way experiment is done now. We have isothermal expansion, which means you play from k, min, uh, k maximum to k min. And then at the same time, you vary the t, uh, hot and the cold. This is the effective temperature. I'm just reminding you the implementation of Stirling cycle in this regime. So the experiment is done uh, by putting two electrodes, and the colloidal particle is trapped in between them. And uh, uh, this is where we will be doing all the imaging to get the particle position. Correct? It's experimentally, I hope it's clear. And we vary the noise, the voltage applied to the electrodes. So we have a Gaussian uh, distribution uh, with some magnitude. And that magnitude will decide, the sigma uh, decide, what is the effective temperature. So, it's, uh, so now this is what is the situation. You have a trapped particle. Uh, you will have uh, the ions rearrange because uh, uh, of the electric, uh, this ar arrangement. And electric field, you will have the electroosmotic flows. This is a field which is extremely well studied and extremely complicated. Because there are many, many possibilities here in terms of time scale. I will not go into all that. But need, just to emphasize that there is an interaction now of the ions and the effective temperature and the way things are arranged. But one thing is good, once it is a Gaussian white noise, if you look at the P of delta Y in this, uh, y is this direction, it is completely Gaussian, completely. So black one is without the electric field, and the red one is with the uh, this uh, 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 electric noise. And you can see the width, which decides the effective temperature. It can be as much as you want. So in our case, we have varied from 400 Kelvin to 1800 Kelvin. You can do that. So this number is important here. The voltage noise, we put it at 2 kilohertz. 
please remember this number, which means every 0.5 millisecond, the voltage is changing randomly. And our sampling of this Y is at 500 hertz, which much larger than that, which means every uh, 0.2, is that correct? Morning, you can't do without calculator. <laughs> but right, point, so it's much larger than that, right? So you have averaged it. But here is the surprise, you see now. What we are doing, we are uh, uh, varying the V effective is fixed at a given at a K. So we have fixed K, laser light is fixed. We vary the V in, in, uh, in uh, these three uh, ex uh, experiments. Let's look at this. Depending on the K, how much laser light you are putting, I'm going slowly here so that you absorb the experiment, you do not get the same T effective. You look at that. For various values of K in this regime, your effective temperature depends on the engine Hamiltonian. But at larger K, which is what I told you in the last slide, there is no effect. And all the other experiments have been done in this regime, which means engine bath interaction was uh, not there. This is the exciting part. And this, you can see, this is what five micron particle with two voltages. For two micron, this effect is less. And if we put salt, <coughs> this effect is even less. This can be easily understood because the rearrangement time of the ions around a colloidal particle depends on the particle radius. So if you reduce the particle radius, tau s will reduce. So effect will be less. And if you read, uh, temperature is here, which we didn't vary, but this M naught is here, please remember. This is the ion concentration, the impurity ion concentration, which you can add or subtract. If you put more salt, <coughs> tau s will be very small. <coughs> so again, you will have no effect. And this is exactly what we showed experimentally that you can have a regime where you can have energy bath interaction due to this electroosmotic noise. We have the electroosmotic noise. Now it is controlling the energy bath interaction uh, because there is a coupling of the T effective and the engine Hamiltonian K. I hope if this part is clear, next part is very uh, easy to move on. Once we do that, you can see other time scale. This is one time scale. Uh, other, of course, these are the control parameters which we varied. And thermal noise is very, very fast correlation, 10 microseconds. So it's not an issue because our cycle time is up to few milliseconds. So this is not relevant. Applied noise, I already told you, 0.5 millisecond uh, applied noise. And position sampling is 2 millisecond. So now if you see, if you know K, K threshold in our case is 4 piconewton per micron. If your K is more than four, engine bath interaction will not be there because I told you that this is flat. So please keep these numbers, then I'll show you the main results now. Oh, sorry. So again, our K maximum and K minimum in the heat engine varies from these two limits. In these two limits, your uh, relaxation due to thermal noise would have been gamma over K times 2.3, because this is a 90% relaxation. It will be 270 millisecond, which is known. There is no surprise. And for uh, the other limit of uh, uh, this uh, K max, it will be 99 or 100 millisecond. So this is how given. So if this is the case, how can we reduce the cycle time? That's the point. And this is what I will show you, that now we make a Stirling cycle. You can see that T effective. Now, you will ask, how do you do this experiment? Because T effective depends on K. So at every K, I adjust my voltage so that it is constant. I hope it is clear. That constant is 300 Kelvin, which means no noise. This is easy. But here is what is the control coming, uh, around 425. And you can get a Stirling cycle in this protocol between these two K limits. But now what happens is when we vary tau, so this is the key result. I will just take you over. 
we plot the average work done uh, over, uh, some of them are averaged over 50,000 cycles, some of them uh, are averaged over few hundred. So you can look at the patience of the student who has done these experiments because these colloidal particles do not stay in the trap for all time to come if you have not done your prayers right in the morning. So you have to do everything right, impurities, everything has to be right if you do it correctly. Uh, over months, Sudish has done these experiments and what we get in the end is the following. This is the quasi-static limit. It exactly matches with theory, whatever uh, uh, theoretical limit it matches at around uh, 50 seconds. Then it starts coming down as expected because this is what we know. But now at this time scale, tau L, which we are calling, you can see now with something very exciting happening. Instead of going down and stalling the heat engine, actually it has gone up. Even for a time which is 10 to 12 milliseconds. Look at the efficiency. Again, you know everything about the system. You know the work done. You know the heat calculated. Again, efficiency is maximum. This is the theoretical limit. Comes down. It should have gone uh, below zero. But then it starts going up. And then you see it reaches the Carnot limit. Carnot limit is coming when it is 12 milliseconds. you can absorb this number, which is so surprising when we saw that, because we were working on this hypothesis. And lo and behold, it is really uh, this engine bath interaction, what I brought out in the last few slides, has an effect that it is affecting the relaxation time. Now, which relaxation time? I'll come you in a minute. That I have not told you. And you can see that efficiency has reached the uh, uh, Carnot efficiency. And you can also plot uh, power. Because you know W, you can plot power, which is here. You can see the power is increasing. This is the maximum. This is the Curzon uh, uh, L-bomb value we verified. Starts coming down. At this tau L, you see other processes built in. And now you have reached so high power. And efficiency is 30%. So here, the power efficiency trade-off which has been uh, theorized and experimentally observed, has a way to overcome if you can play with the engine bath interaction. That's the moral. Now, which time is re reduced? I have to tell you. And not going into, OK. OK, I think I have a tendency to lose track of time. Uh, huh. We don't take that. Okay, so you look at the particle, how it is doing the work, mm -hmm. and the heat input to that path. That's the way. Uh, you, don't, you don't take how coal is burned and how this is done. No, that is not taken. OK, now let me give you uh, this, what is happening. At this time, no surprise, beautiful Stirling cycle, right? Uh, which is what we know, because tau is much, much larger than all tau hours relaxation times. Now you see, at this time, I will not show you all the plots, at this time, when things are not really going down and starting to increase, when we plot the Stirling cycle, it has no resemblance to what you talk. Because there is an interaction now, K and T. Please remember, experimentally, we are trying to keep the same T. It's not that uh, uh, V is uh, relaxed, because it's critical to keep that experimental things right. Now you see that at this stage, oh, sorry. If you look at this isotherm, uh, this, uh, the, this uh, red one is the isotherm expansion, where you get the useful work. R blue is the isotherm compression, where you do work on the system. And you can see the red one is still above the area. And if you integrate, you will see that you are almost uh, close and close to uh, very, very small w. I have written the details I will not go into. But now at 100 millisecond here, you can see that actually the, these things are completely changing. 
and when I, I, uh, when I put here, once again the isothermal expansion has come at the top, which was really stalling the heat engine. So what is happening is uh, in Stirling cycle thing I have shown you, and now uh, let me, ah, this is 15 millisecond, I did have a graph. You can see that it is this, this is a measured one. And please know that these points are averaged over thousands and thousands of this thing. You don't get in one cycle. The averaging is almost in some places, it's like a few thousands. Okay. Now, at this time, we saw that above TL, tau L, it exactly matches with Curzon Olbaum. And Bulbul, this is another uh, derivation of uh, the maximum power at this efficiency by Schmidl and Seifert uh, in 2008, which is slightly different than this. And this is numerically same number. And below that, the whole the fun starts, where energy bath interaction, engine bath interaction, I'm sorry, starts playing a role. Now what is happening? Uh, let me give you the final story so that we don't build up on it. What we have found that the relaxation is much, much faster in the isochoric cycle. What was the isochoric, please remember? We were decreasing the temperature, keeping the volume same, right? At K max and K min, we were keeping K max fixed and decreasing the temperature or increasing the temperature, right? This is what isochoric. At this time, we measure T effective in the cycle time, uh, T over tau, we, uh, we do the appropriate renormalization. In 50 seconds, this is the graph, which is something we expect, how much time it takes. But here you see, at 50 millisecond when we measure in that pulse, in 50 millisecond duration, which is 25 millisecond expansion, 25 cooling, you see that it equilibrates within 12 millisecond. So the electrophoretic noise actually is adding to the equilibration. Now why, I'll come in a minute. So that is the one which is saying, don't hang around too long, let's come to equilibrium. And this is about 17 for cooling. And same thing is true at K max, again another data. Again it takes uh, 11 millisecond, which should have taken about 120 millisecond. So please remember, here it should have taken 270 millisecond if it was just thermal fluctuations. Instead of 270, it reduced to about 15 millisecond. So this is the electrophoretic noise in the regime where the engine Hamiltonian, the K, and the bath, uh, effective bath temperature are coupled. And we showed that, okay, isothermal part we have shown, I have not discussed, it is there in the paper, it does not change. It is same as for thermal. Here is the interesting thing, which is not difficult to guess, it's a kind of intuitive. When we are applying a voltage, every 0.5 millisecond it is changing. But in 0.5 millisecond, you have a voltage. What will happen? The colloidal particle will move in the electric field. So you have a ballistic motion of the colloidal particle for 0.5 millisecond, which is what we plot the average Y for two voltages. And when you have no voltage, it is zero. So what you have, which is an obvious thing, that you have brought in a ballistic uh, component to induce the equilibration. So longer ballistic time of the driving force is what is the message. I'll come back to it when I discuss the second part. So the question obviously is, is this the only way to do? Can you do another way so that you play with this uh, long correlation time and still reduce tau r? So this is something I'll leave it with this slide. This is the message. I will not go into detail. Again, remind you, this is the breakdown, which we said. All right, uh, we have to now decide. I have about 15, 20 minutes. Okay, when you are also fed up, please just say this so that, uh, uh, because I get the, uh, you know, all being professors here, I'm sure you all love talking, so you can understand. Uh, but uh, I appreciate your time. I will not take more than 15 minutes. Now, this is what uh, we have been doing. We have been operating earlier in thermal baths, not in the electrophoretic, but in the earlier examples so far. But we know that the biological motors, 
are not in equilibrium bath. All sorts of motor uh, things are happening. And in complex environment, what will be happen to an electric uh, with the heat engine? That is a very uh, appropriate question. There is no macroscopic equivalent. You can't play with that in a piston and a cylinder. So this is where uh, this uh, important thing comes. Can we engineer the reservoir? Don't work with the thermal reservoirs. Don't work with equilibrium reservoir. Play with the reservoirs. Can you make a non-equilibrium reservoir and see the heat engine? So the first experiment which we did was in 2016 uh, published was where the reservoir was uh, manipulated using bacteria. So we had colloidal particles and living bacteria together and bacterial motion was affecting the colloidal particles. So the trapping is still colloidal particle, please uh, remember that. Engine is created with colloidal particle. And uh, this is what was done uh, in 2016 with our bio colleagues who gave us the right uh, education to handle bacteria. And what we showed that by varying the activity of bacteria appropriately between the two temperatures of 313 Kelvin when bacteria are agitated and 27 Kelvin where bacteria are alive but sluggish. So we play with the laziness and the activity of the bacteria with this minor temperature window and because you know how bacteria uh, uh, respond to that. And this we varied poor bacteria over 500 cycles. So we made them live for 500 cycles or 1000 cycles as long as they could make. And we uh, 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 made a heat engine. Please trust me, it took three years of Sudesh life to learn about bacteria. Because when we started being a physicist, we were quite dismissive that what bacteria have to obey us. But they don't obey us. They die without telling you. And they behave without telling you. So we had a huge learning curve uh, with our bio colleagues, Sudesh, hats off to Sudesh. He kept his uh, patience. And we showed the heat engine. So instead of isothermal uh, uh, expansion, it is isoactive expansion. So the effective temperature is being decided by the bacterial activity in this part. It is uh, constant. Here it is isoactive compression and then the two cooling. So this is something I thought I will uh, uh, not too much discuss. Bacteria are very active. Bacteria are very sluggish. And you can see that the probability distribution is also varying. More importantly, it is non-Gaussian. And that non-Gaussian puts us a challenge. How do we calculate the effective temperature? Because we said KBT is equal to uh, this uh, width. What we took approach, which is one of the approach, not the ideal approach, we simply measured the variance, simply, and equated to an effective temperature. There are many ways to do it. We did this way. Because this way gives us a scale of the bacterial activity. And once we do that, experimentally we know whether the bacteria are active or not. So T active, please remember. So we are varying T active between the two uh, cycles. Isothermal expansion, high activity. Isothermal compression, low activity. And then cycle is done. And now this is the result. The average work done as a function of delta T active, because many, many experiments have been done, few hundreds of them. You can see this is one where there is no bacteria, 0 0.03 kBT. And now it increases. And at this temperature difference, this activity difference, it is almost like 100 times. So huge work done by bacteria on the engine. And uh, this part I will not tell you. This only tells you that if the fluctuations were only Gaussian, this would have been the case. So, and this whole action is happening due to non-Gaussian noise of the engine. And efficiency, please see, this is uh, without bacteria or uh, dead bacteria. And then this is the one where it even exceeds the theoretical limit, equilibrium theoretical limit. Because there is no reason to be stuck this is a non-equilibrium system. Theoretically, nobody has derived what should be the way value it should be. And this one is something 
huge work done, huge efficiency of this bacterial heat engine. So quick take home, uh, they perform <coughs> due to non-Gaussian fluctuations and active engines only operated in quasi-static limit. All experiments were done when the cycle time was 22 seconds, quasi-static limit. Noise in bacterial bath is now both non-Gaussian and finite. It has a memory. Can you have variations of that? Can you say, I want this noise of reservoir with this kurtosis, this width, this skewness? Can you do that? Sorry, bacteria don't obey us. We have no control. So what Rajesh and his student did uh, was build up on an earlier paper by Silverto uh, idea that now you take another laser beam along with your trapping beam and flash that laser, small power. So that laser is giving the noise. Right? because you have a, another laser power. That one at various delta A's with a distribution, you can easily show this will be like a effective noise. And this is the one which will decide what is the statistics of the displacement. So we keep the laser intensity same, we fluctuate the position. You can also play with the intensity, there is no problem. But here it is done with delta A. If you have delta A chosen from a Gaussian distribution, extremely small distribution, you can easily show that the effective temperature will be around 1300. If you vary uh, the magnitude of delta A, you can see it's 1140, Gaussian. And you can easily show that power uh, spectral density is exactly like what you have for uh, the Gaussian noise. Now the fun comes when you have P delta A like this, huge non-Gaussian. So the laser light is fluctuating like this. And now you can see the distribution is the red one. So now you can play with anything now. You can play with the skewness. You can play with the kurtosis. You can also play with the width. Now these two have the same width. So the effective temperature is same, but huge statistical differences. So this is the reservoir engineering, which I wanted to mention and give you one example of uh, Gaussian of this beautiful uh, experiment, what we have used. So again, you can now get anything. You can get uh, kurtosis 27, you can get same temperature kurtosis 3, you can get uh, uh, more temperature 10. So now you are the master. You can say what you want theoretically in order to test an idea and you can play with this. So uh, Rajesh and uh, uh, Nilandu, the work of Nilandu, they showed that now you can make a uh, uh, Stirling cycle where you are varying from the non-Gaussian white noise, non-Gaussian white noise, no memory, to a Gaussian part and what will happen. You can do anything, both you can make non-Gaussian, anything you want. And this is where is uh, what uh, I will not discuss as enormous possibilities which was summed up in this uh, paper in uh, uh, two years back. I will not discuss those results. The last part, which I want to mention for about five, seven minutes, again, very exciting, because it is, has some connection to my first story, and this is where I will leave. What we have done, that in this case, our reservoir has always been viscoelastic, water, no, sorry, uh, viscous fluid, uh, either water, water glycerol, whatever you there. So the, Bath has no structure, no relaxation time, which is incomparable. It's much, much faster. What happens if the reservoir is viscoelastic? And I told you, this is something you should keep in mind. Can we play, as we mentioned in this paper, using viscoelastic bath to play with the uh, uh, ballasticity? Please remember this thought process. So what we do, again, uh, I will not go into, these are viscoelastic uh, fluids and many people in this room are making living out of it. And this is the viscoelastic uh, system we are having. This is the worm-like micelle, uh, a system which was started by Ranjini uh, in her prime youth and uh, carried over by Rajesh, then Sayantan, 
and I think uh, uh, maybe Rajesh has again uh, come back uh, to that in the, his lab on some other. So this is the system we are playing with. These are worm like micelles. They entangle and give you a viscoelastic one. Just remember that and I will not need anything more. M modulus versus uh, driving frequency had two parts. Low frequency uh, viscous, uh, viscous part uh, uh, dominant and after this elastic part dominance. This behaves like a solid, this behaves like a liquid. So this is the viscoelasticity. So we will be playing now with a viscoelastic gel where the colloidal particle is trapped which will span this region from the viscous part as we go towards the elasticity. So our, I, so you can guess already what we are asking. We are asking when the system has elasticity, elastic response, will it affect the engine performance? Will it bring engine bath interaction? That's the point. So, uh, so you can see this is the regime we have been covering. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, spectral density, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, for various parameters, I will not worry about you. This time you please keep in mind is 0.13 seconds, 130 milliseconds. Just only that number I want you to remember. Heat engine made, isothermal expansion, isochoric uh, uh, cooling, compression, heating. Temperatures, please note. 452 to 98. This could not have been possible with a normal heating. Because the moment you change the heating, it will no longer remain warm like myself. So here you need an effective temperature. So reservoir engineering is a must. It's not a choice. Otherwise, this experiment could not have been done uh, by uh, Niloy and Rajesh. This one you can now play. So the we have not touched the micelles, the gels, those time constants are still the same, 130 millisecond crossover point. And you can now see, just to compare, because we have a tendency to forget at the end of one hour, this is in uh, viscous medium, not viscoelastic. Nothing surprising. If you look at the power, power will be zero at large tau. Again, it will peak in decrease. This is the Curzon album and efficiency at that point matches with Curzon elbow. No surprise, engine stalls below 7 seconds, right? Because W also you can see becomes positive. Now we put them in viscoelastic bath and now you have the biggest surprise. This is the value, theoretical value at large tau, 200 second. It remains this, instead of now coming down, actually it more or less remains constant. So at this time, when engine had stalled at this point, in viscous bath, in viscoelastic gel, as you are going towards the transition point, where the elasticity has started performing its part, you have the work done. So the work is getting done now by the elasticity of the uh, medium. And you can see that we have covered a huge range. Actually, it, at uh, large tau, which is the small frequency, uh, sorry, small tau, which is the large frequency, this you don't expect if it was a viscous medium. Because of viscoelasticity, you have a complete flattening instead of going down and uh, stalling, actually it is almost remaining the same. And this is something uh, took us uh, what we had expected. You can see this is the data and the power is obviously zero here and now it is positive. This is huge power. Actually it should have already decreased to zero and negative. And the efficiency you see uh, W over Q is remaining the same theoretical value as for the quasi static. This is again you can see we have broken down the power efficiency trade off by another construct, by bringing a structured medium. And the reason is, again, I will not take more time. When we vary this tau, actually the particle, uh, of course, has a, a mean square displacement. At smaller time, we would not have expected uh, to do much displacement because the things are changing too fast. 
but once it is viscoelastic actually it is still spanning the whole potential well so you can see experimentally you can see that and uh, uh, picture is this i will i think close with this in a viscous bath when you have elastic uh, uh, when you don't have the elasticity then this thing has no reason it's all random inside it's diffusion in a potential well but once you have elasticity then you have a huge tendency that the particle will immediately come back and try to equilibrate because the elasticity is pulling back so how do you quantify this and this is what uh, niloy and rajesh did they looked at a probability that if your particle is here in the end in the beginning of a cycle what is the probability that it will end up in the same quadrant after cycle and that one is above 0.5 so this is where uh, just to hammer this is uh, again stirling cycles uh, you can show it is same for 200 very different for 0.5 second and i think at this stage i'll close to go back to my uh, last slide so uh, the goal was to show you that this engine bath interaction which we uh, manipulated in our experiments because it is a mesoscopic engine not the macroscopic engine we have a control it allows to overcome power efficiency trade off via electrophoretic noise we also showed you that reservoir engineering you can do uh, which i call photon phantom which rajesh doesn't agree but it's like a phantom you are just putting additional a way to control allowing tuning of reservoir noise statistics structured fluid bath the last part, uh, second part of my talk where elasticity comes into play and this is the part which i did not say where we brought two engines together and when we brought two engines together even in a thermal bath what will you expect you will say if my bath is in equilibrium my total work done cannot be more than 1 plus 1 because that is the zeroth law of thermodynamics because otherwise you will violate thermodynamics if you have a non equilibrium system you can violate that and what we showed when you bring this together actually it is a almost like a motor because there are elect the currents generated which is called uh, brownian vortices which is a, uh, uh, the system is churned that brings the coupling uh, of this two and you get much much more then uh, the uh, isolated one and that is what we showed and now there are so many possibilities uh, which are happening what happens if you have internal degree of freedom of your particle you have only one particle now you can play with the polymer you can attach a dna uh, tether all those things are the ones which are happening in rajesh lab so i'll just close it uh, this is the one which just got accepted Uh, but, but this is the only change in my slide uh, at that time this was not there so in last uh, few days it has come uh, this one uh, we should be hearing soon uh, revision has been submitted uh, of this uh, viscoelasticity and this appeared last year so i think with this let me thank uh, once again all of you for this very very patient listening and uh, i couldn't have been here to give this talk but for the collaborators who are doing all the work so thank you and uh, uh, congratulations again on the foundation day and if there are questions i'll be happy to take <laughs> sorry I, you had given me one hour i oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. i hope i have not exceeded yeah so that was a wonderful tour uh, the you know if, from the first part of your talk right when you just use the electrophoretic noise if i wanted to sort of think of moving in the direction of non equilibrium noise one way to do that would have been to introduce a sort of correlated noise at that stage through some device Absolutely. so is it the right way to think about it that yes, at the end of the day uh, no 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 i agree with that because that possibility is also there right because we have put a gaussian noise correct 
because life is complicated even with that. Yeah, yeah. But there are many more new things, which uh, one of the direction which you said is that. Right. And there will be some interesting concepts. You no, know, but the question I wanted to ask is, with, with, with the viscoelastic medium, is that effectively what you're achieving? Because the noise no, that no, one no, should is, be... No, 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 no. Viscoelastic one is still Gaussian. No, no, but the noise one should be thinking about, I suppose, is noise, noise is Gaussian. that is applied on the colloidal bead. So... Uh, sorry, sorry, let me uh, take yeah. it back. Uh, there are three parts to today's story, and that's what I think. Uh, yeah. In the viscoelastic part, the noise is generated by the laser fluctuation. Uh, okay. Because that delta A sorry. and the width, yeah. that is Gaussian. Okay, okay, now, okay, okay. Yeah. I thought you were referring to that. That delta A, I can also have a non Gaussian then the resultant will be non-Gaussian in the viscoelastic one. We have not explored that. Okay. You can imagine the complication. But even yeah. in the okay. Gaussian one, we have the breakdown. I mean, we couldn't be asking for more. Yeah. At the smallest tau, when it is comparable to the elastic point, the elasticity is doing all the work and overcoming the irreversibility. Yeah. So the message is that elasticity overcomes the irreversibility which is inherent in a viscous bath. I hope I have, uh, no, thank no, you for no, asking. No. Yeah. 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 So uh, this reservoir. Yeah, yeah. No, as non-organizer, he has a preference. <laughs> but you wrote me. Wrongly accused of being the organizer. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I have been getting so many mails, I forgot. Huh. Tell me. So, then uh, you, Rajini. Huh. So, I have a question about this reservoir statistics manipulation, what you have shown. So, I was wondering in one of your slides where you were introducing these kicks and they were fairly sparsely spaced in time. and very long time I was observing, almost like a rare event. Yep. So yep, something yep, yep. like what one absolutely, absolutely. Levy is statistics. The, that is why the delta A tail mm -hmm. is very large mm -hmm. and that affected P of delta Y. Right. Hugely, it was uh, initially, you can see the initial central part was more or less Gaussian, that huge non-Gaussian tail. Exactly. Precisely for that so, reason. So just to ask precisely, so are you saying that this tail is what matters, just a small deviation from Gaussian is not what is going to give you the Both. result. So which part we are talking, we have to be again clear. Mm -hmm. That part was not non-Gaussian in my viscoelastic engine. I hope it is clear. That part was done to show that kurtosis has a huge effect on the engine performance because our bacterial path was non-Gaussian with large kurtosis, but also memory. So in the uh, simplify the problem, we said it will be non-Gaussian, but white. We didn't want to complicate it. So that is the one which I did not show the full result. So the net result was when we change the kurtosis, actually the engine starts stalling at very, very uh, large tau. It doesn't even go to five seconds. It stalls even at 12 seconds. And the work becomes uh, positive. I mean, uh, it stalls it. So kurtosis has a huge effect. So that was the purpose. In the viscoelastic one, we have not played with the non-Gaussianity. Yeah. Sanjay. Thanks for a very nice talk, uh, Ajay. Uh, I have many questions and curiosities. So uh, from the last part, because you just stopped with viscoelastic, I was wondering if you had uh, maybe added salt to you know increase the elastic correlations yes, and yes, does yes. that increase the yeah. extracted power yeah. further? That's correct. Answer yeah. is yes. Yeah. As long as students don't commit uh, haragari and leave. <laughs> okay. Because and, and it each experiment a problem, right? is two-year project. I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, so uh, answer is it will play. Mm -hmm. Only thing is. We do not expect a very, very significant new results mm -hmm. as long as it is from viscous to elasticity. Mm -hmm. 
There will be some other issues. But the power are, extracted would increase. Uh, magnitudes will vary. Okay. Right. Magnitudes, magnitudes will vary. Would vary. Yeah. But uh, uh, not, uh, so to say, the physics part of it. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, about the, you know, so the bacterial bath uh, work, where I understand that you're saying that you're extracting a lot more work because of the non-Gaussian nature of the underlying fluctuations. Now, uh, it's an active bath as compared to a passive bath. You're, it's kind of related to what also Pramod asked. So you're constantly having to feed your bacteria yeah. to keep them alive. We are not so, taking that energy into account. Yeah, I was wondering part. why. Yeah. Because in the uh, engine thing, what you need is actually the effective, how much is the uh, heat input and the work mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. We do not worry even when we calculate uh, for an engine, we do not say how the gas was heated mm -hmm. using nuclear reactor or the other reactor. All those things are of course important in the practical life. Mm -hmm. But when we talk of work done and efficiency, that is not what is calculated. Mm -hmm. Here you take the effective uh, heat input mm -hmm. and the work done. Okay. That's all what what is taken in the engine, uh, this thing, but not because bacteria are also spending a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. So we are not taking that into mm -hmm. account. Are they reproducing during your 500 cycles and? That's what I said. Yeah. I didn't yeah. show you the data. Okay. The fluctuations are huge. Uh, sorry, I right. should not give you an impression that it's a very uh, nice data. If you plot the W per cycle, mm -hmm. it goes all over the place mm -hmm. because it's uh, very stochastic. Mm -hmm. The average is what I was showing you with the huge error bar. I don't know if you right, noticed. Right, right. So that is intrinsic okay. to the engine, actually. Okay. Thank you. So, this efficiency when you calculate that, so it's basically like the work done by the heat. So, did you actually first compute the average of the work done and the average of the heat and then took the ratio or? Yes, uh, in, the, uh, in our experiment. In yeah. So, you could also like uh, compute the stochastic work done. And yeah, so we have plotted P of W also. Uh, no, in the what I meant is that uh, P of W by Q Huh. So the in principle, yeah. so we, uh, all these possibilities, actually we do plot P of W okay. and how it is non-Gaussian and how the it shifts. No, what I meant is that did you also, I'm wondering whether it's possible to also uh, find the P of the efficiency. The yes, answer is yes. No, answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer is yes. Yeah, okay. We have not uh, done it, but it is answer. We have the data. Okay. At, the, at least for the, uh, this electrophoric. Or sure, it is sure. Probably. Answer is yes. Sorry. All right, so that was a really beautiful talk and it was primarily motivated by abstract questions in statistical physics. And it almost seems like you were just making things up and creating something very artificial to study an abstract question. But it's not at all abstract because in the real world, yeah. there are small scale motors yeah. that have non-Gaussian noise in a viscoelastic environment and yeah. those are the motors inside of a cell. Yeah. And I was hoping that maybe you could speculate for us a little bit about okay. what uh, you might be able to say about, so they're not heat engines, but there they're are motors. Well, but anyway, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so. Actually that is the introduction of our paper, whatever you're writing, motivation. Oh, it's the, it's the motivation. Of our paper, which will appear soon. Okay. Okay. So tell so, us. Yeah. So answer is yes, it has that, but there are differences. Whether, But the viscoelastic bath is not a new uh, thing in the actual environment. For the reason you said, the cell environment is not uh, all fully viscous. How much of it you can learn from this, I don't know the answer. Maybe Jack can uh, articulate. But there is the... In the cyclic heat engine is what we have shown. But if you are talking of the motors, not the cyclic one, what effect will have? I don't know the answer. No, but the, the efficiency of your molecular motor, uh, the yeah. It's, a, it's a essentially isothermal motor, and it's a different. Altogether, it's, it's that a different physics. Yeah. So we are only talking of the cyclic heat engine. Correct. Yeah, you had a question. Yes. Yeah, thank you. That was beautiful. So you flashed a, a slide after this one. <laughs> which oh, you did notice. You have a good <laughs> eyesight. This and is this, the slide, this, Rajesh. Uh, Rajesh, can we discuss? 
<laughs> okay, so I mean, okay. I can imagine, so since it flashed by, I've been sitting here thinking. This is the one Ex which you will hear in so, uh, next year's talk okay. by Rajesh. But I can imagine an argument where the collective behaviors destroy the effect, and I can imagine scenarios where they enhance the effect. So here you can, see, uh, you can see an experimental construct which uh, uh, Rajesh and Niloy have done. What they have done is they have made a colloidal polymer. Okay, not the normal polymer, colloidal polymer combining this all these colloidal particles. So it's a very flexible colloidal polymer. Now the idea here is you can trap this part, you can trap this part. You can vary the trap stiffness. And if you vary the stiffness of one trap, what happens to the other one is what is shown here. When you vary that, actually the other one does beautiful work. Be this connection and you can now play with it. So you can make a full heat engine out of this. But the beauty here is the engine which I created for you, if you ask me will it do some useful work, can I run my car on it or something on it, we don't know how to do that, right, the colloidal heat engine. So the practicality of that is yet to be worked out. But one of the idea is you can have a colloidal particle in a trap, you can have something connected like a DNA or something which is mentioned in one of the uh, review article and it's like a flywheel, attach something to the other one and this does all the work and carries your cargo when this is doing the cycling. Here it is a, uh, a uh, experimental realization of that idea. What we are doing is we are trapping this you can now play with the entropy of the chain and you can do many, many things, heat engine with internal degrees of freedom. So this is the trailer of uh, the work. Maybe this is... Rajesh, did I capture it right? Yeah. Maybe this question huh. is connected with that perhaps. Is there a sort of upper limit on the size of the system in which you can see these beautiful effects. Okay. Uh, Is there let, any intrinsic? Yeah. Well, no, 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 very good question actually. We have played with the colloidal particle sizes. Less than one micron to five micron is no issue. It is very important when you want to talk of the engine bath interaction because that decides the uh, time in which this interaction is possible. For the other engines, it is not a important parameter. But uh, I don't know, many of you will be knowing, a similar idea has been shown almost eight years back with an atom. Instead of an optical trap, they have this what uh, these people use, optical, uh, optical uh, the atomic trap, and they have made a Gaussian heat engine as a demonstration. But that's where it is stopped. So uh, that work is very beautiful, single atom. That uh, is what is done here with colloidal particle which has much, much more flexibility. Because in atomic systems, how will you play with the reservoir, how will you play this, it's not trivial. Here it is much, much easy because you have increased your length scale and many other possibilities. But very good question. Atomic heat engines have been made. Only, sorry, sorry, sorry. Engine has been made. There is only one paper and after that it has never been followed. Yes. You yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to ask a very simple question on the bacterial uh, engine one. Uh, but the first thing is, did you need PETA clearance for it? I mean, did you need Bacteria? clearance from the animal rights, uh, animal rights activists, you know, for using the bacteria? I'm just Good uh, question. Uh, uh, we have not declared like Hindi movies, they say no harm was no to harm animals. Harm was. Okay. So here we have not declared because right. bacteria have not yet come in that domain. Okay, okay. If they come, we'll have to declare. But uh, trust me, these bacteria have a mind of their own. So <laughs> I really, we... Uh, they last for clearance, so maybe you tone uh, it down. Yeah. Uh, 
So I have a, a more serious question than that, which is actually, I mean, you know, because it's not my field, but, you know, this heat engine that you showed, I think the difference in temperature was because of the difference in the activity level, right? So the, in the, uh, the bacteria, bacteria one, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they were very active at the high temperature and very, you know, sluggish at the low temperature and so on. High and low were differing only by 20 Kelvin. 20 Kelvin. So now the question is, can you reverse this problem and actually use this as some kind of a sensor for, you know, sensing the activity of bacteria uh, a bit more continuously maybe than just this jump from one to the other? Yeah, so answer is uh, yes. Actually, if you see our quantification of T activity is what we do for one particle in a given temperature. Only thing is it will be overkill for this. I mean, you can do uh, whatever you want with this, but uh, that will be overkill as a sensor. But maybe there can be some uh, uh, very unique uh, uh, usage in biological sense. Yes. That I think one has to see. If you can trap this colloidal particle inside a living cell, let's say in the bath, mm -hmm. and do something with it, maybe. You're right. And the motors will play the role of uh, the bacteria, possibly. Thanks, Jay, for the wonderful talk. In the first part, the colloidal heat engine, when you were showing us the heating and cooling cycles uh, and you, when you approached the Carnot cycle. So the heating and the cooling curves did not intersect. But when you were at the efficiency where you had high efficiency, the heating and the cooling curves were intersecting, the red and the blue curves. Yes, I want, yes. I wonder if this is something generic for non-equilibrium heat engines? Because at equilibrium... You are talking of the first part the of the first part of the... Yeah. So the first part of the talk, it depends on what is the time scale of relaxation what is tau s, the ion reorientation time, and the coupling between T and K. All that decides the trajectory. And that depends on the combination of all the three time scales. And this is what is reflected here. Though we are trying to keep the T effective same, please remember, experimentally, there is no letdown. But the point is the system does not have time to respond. That's why it does not really have this. So everything is okay till 20 seconds. Everything follows. But uh, below that, or below one second actually, or uh, five seconds, I've forgotten now, then all these things start. And they can uh, cross each other. There is nothing. Ajay, I have a um, very statistical figure physics kind of question or idea. You have all of these. You know, you're looking at the work, the efficiency, and the power, and there's so many things that you can vary, right? Either the back properties or the noise. Is there, can you think of a way of scaling these things on top of each other so that you understand, you know, is, is, the, is there a scaling collapse that one can do so, with, let's say, the kurtosis and the viscoelasticity and... Yeah, so there has not been any attempt on that, but what you can do is the simplest thing, you can plot P of W distributions. If you want to see how they scale in if uh, some things are varying in the last example and all, maybe yes. But the point you have to see, these are, I mean, you can talk in terms of probability distributions of these quantities. No, I was thinking more just macroscopic observables, but you know, if I, let's say, vary the kurtosis in one direction and the viscoelasticity ah. in the other and get the same ah, I, no, uh, nobody macroscopic no, property. No, no, I got that answer. Very, very exciting, but no, uh, no even hint of uh, what to expect. But this is just to tell you that now the experimental tools have been developed where you can control things very well and try to attempt the questions which theorists can ask. That's the whole idea of the talk. Yeah. I like very much the interaction with the, with the bath because I think this is a generic situation. Yeah. Because a real bath does not exist. Yeah. And so and, and I think it's fantastic to, to study this interaction with the bath. Wow. I think it's very important. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, Jack. Other question? Students? If not, uh, I have a, uh, can I ask? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so first part uh, of your uh, talk, like uh, this electrophoretic noise, you are like applying this Gaussian noise. 
So, but uh, from other experiments, it is known that non-Gaussian having fat tails have some uh, yeah. advantages. So, I was wondering, like, if we just change it to colored noise, then you get yeah, yeah, yeah. And that color. correct. No, no. Answer is yes. It can be done, and this is what Sudesh was trying to do before he was whisked away to Berkeley. So Maybe that's exactly right. It takes uh, to set up because you can now generate any noise electrically. There is not a this is not a problem. Uh, you can uh, play with the uh, various uh, electrical circuits and do that. You can do many smart things. But uh, so we were trying to do first with the non-Gaussian one. And this is when the experiments were. Thanks. Anything? OK, if there is no other question, let's thank uh, Professor Keith for your wonderful time. For a fascinating talk, I mean, it's it's amazing. I'm not in the field, but you know, it's very exciting to see this uh, kind of very deep work and uh, you know, the experimental realization. I did not mention. I only mentioned his role as a national uh, leader of science and, of course, an exceptional uh, experimental physicist. But I should mention that he has very deep connections to the institute. So in some sense, the Platinum Jubilee lecture being given by him is, you know, in two ways very important because he has been a member of the governing council since 2006 and he had been the chairman of the governing council for five or seven years, I think, before he uh, left for uh, Delhi, as he says, in a different role. And I think the institute must be retaining a lot of imprint of his very, very deep association with the science. So as a governing council member, he not only just, you know, was a, in his administrative role, but he really deeply was concerned with the, how the science grew. And I think he has influenced a lot uh, in the institute. And what you see now is a result of uh, his thank efforts, you. and I wanted to also take this opportunity to thank him for that. Thank you. No, no, it's all, all of you. And yeah. uh, finally, it's my pleasant task to oh, let's uh, give you a memento. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for having me. Wonderful.